tragedy hit. My father had never had a car accident, much less a speeding ticket in his life. And here he was in Fairfax County Hospital, lying in the hospital bed in a coma, completely unconscious, no brain activity, and I get a phone call. It's a phone call from my mother. I'm in graduate school in my mid-20s in University of Illinois. I'm told I got to come home, and I better come home quick. There's not much time. And so flying across the country, I'm asking the question that anyone would ask, why? God, why? We're a Christian family. My dad is a believer. He's brought many to Christ He has a great ministry and has helped plant a church. He was very effective in what he was doing. Everything was thriving and going well. And we're asking, why, God, why? You know, we didn't get the answers we were seeking. It only led to more questions. Eventually, my dad would pass away and our family would grieve. The funeral was held and thousands of people attended from across the nation to celebrate the life of my dad. But inside, we were confused. I mean, we had spent a life trusting God and assumed that that trust would always lead to great circumstances. That surely, if you trust Him, you're going to be blessed in every way. Everything's going to be safe and good And yet, here, my dad, lying in that hospital bed, things certainly didn't seem good. You know, in the years that followed, we experienced more death in our family. In fact, my dad witnessed some of that death. I had a brother, a half-brother, who committed suicide. He shot himself and died by suicide. I had another half-brother who... Uh, overdosed on drugs and died that way, and then a sister who also died. And, you know, looking back on all that death and all that loss, sometimes you just feel like shaking your fist at heaven and asking that question, that eternal question, why do you allow this, God? Why can't things be different? Why can't things be better If I have enough faith and I pray hard enough and I cry out to you and I'm trusting you and I'm looking to you just like they say to do, then how can I experience all this negative, all this tragedy, all this trouble, all this loss? Maybe you've asked a question like that and, well, look at this year. It's a year filled with tragedy Not just for us locally, but for the whole world. You talk about loss and disease and death and grief. This year, those are certainly major themes as to what has occurred the last 10 or 11 months. It has been off the charts unbelievable. And so, as we survey the world, looking at all the nations of the world, so many of us have been grieving. Even in our own congregation, we've experienced sickness and death and loss of of loved ones. And maybe you have found yourself this very year asking the question, why? You know, so many are at home, stuck at home, doing less than they've ever done. Depression sets in, grieving the loss of previous activities and, and the level of activity you were engaged in, we grieve such things, and they have an impact psychologically, emotionally. So it's only natural that we would ask why, right? Why is there so much tragedy when I'm trusting God? There's tragedy amidst the trust. Can you explain it to me, God? Why do you allow it? We're asking this question today Maybe we won't get all the answers we're looking for, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see some amazing words from the Apostle Paul who went through it all. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. He begins by saying the message that he proclaims is not his steadfastness, 
The message that he proclaims is not about his stability and his consistency. It's not about what he is doing, but instead about what Christ has done. Maybe this is a lesson we could all learn in Christianity as a whole. How many times have we heard or watched a message that was basically centered on, look at what I have done, look at me, the speaker, look at me, the leader, the pastor, the model citizen, look at what I have done in terms of sacrifice or dedication or commitment or consistency. I'm in the Word and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and you should be like me. Without even realizing it, we end up preaching ourselves. But that's not the gospel, is it? Paul tells us here that the gospel is preaching Jesus, not ourselves. What if we, as a community, what if we, globally, if the body of Jesus Christ shifted focus and began to proclaim the excellencies of all that Jesus has done, and we just harped on that and camped on that, Focusing always on what Jesus accomplished in his finished work. Wouldn't that revolutionize what we call Christianity today? The average person in the world thinks Christianity is that behavior improvement program. That sin lifestyle modification program, if you will. You enter into the the social society of Christianity, you better yourself, you improve your attitudes and actions, you come out a cleaner, better person with better behavior, and well, that's Christianity. And that's why people tiptoe around us, they tiptoe around concepts like Christ and church and faith, and well, they're nervous. They're nervous around spirituality because they see it as nothing more than self-improvement, which they don't want to engage in. But what if we could help the world see? What if we could help the world see that Christianity is really about Jesus? Not about us and how we're doing and how much better we are today than yesterday in terms of behavior, but it's about the behavior of Christ on that cross and through that resurrection. Paul says here, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Isn't that what we're talking about this morning? The darkness? There's darkness all around us with a worldwide pandemic, with tragedy, And yet Paul is speaking of light that comes out of darkness. The idea that light is shining in our hearts and that there's a knowledge that we can have about the end game. You know what I mean, the end game. In the game of chess, you have those beginning moves. You have the moves that occur in the middle of the game. And then, well, there's a strategy all to its own known as the end game how to close out your opponent. And it seems like to me that that's what we're asking God. God, what's the end game? Paul tells us in this passage that there is an end game that we can count on, that we will one day have the knowledge of the glory of God. We will see how light has come out of darkness. We will see that in the midst of tragedy and trouble, there is a triumph. We don't see it clearly. We don't understand it fully right now. But this passage is saying there is an eager expectation for us. Coronavirus has hit. We've experienced disease, illness, social distancing, masks and death. All kinds of awkward and unusual measures. Unbelievable loss across the planet. Certainly, we could call this darkness. And yet, here we see that there's some sort of light in the midst of it. I wonder what God is doing with us. I understand that there's a fallen world and that the enemy is doing things out there. 
But I guess I want to ask, what is God doing with us? What is He doing with you today, right here, right now? What is He up to in your life? He lives in you. What is He seeking to reveal through you? This light shining out of darkness. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. I love how this is expressed. Earthen vessels. It makes me think of pottery. And that's essentially what our human bodies are at this point. I mean, Prior to our future resurrection, these earthen vessels, these bodies are nothing more than dust. Remember that we were formed physically from the dust of the ground, and to dust these earthen vessels will return. This is not it. What you see is not everything. But there is something inside of the pot. There's something inside of the pottery There's something contained within our earthen vessels, and I want us to see that Paul has called it power and even treasure. Do you wake up every morning thinking, I am possessed by power, the power of Christ, that I have a treasure within me? You know, we tend to look at the visible. In the morning, oh, around 7.30 or so, I'll be looking in the mirror. I'll be looking in the mirror and making value judgments about my earthen vessel. Maybe you can relate. I need to wash my face. I need to brush my teeth. I need to comb my hair. And age sets in and we start watching our body decay or deteriorate. We make value judgments about the earthen vessel. Maybe you've done so as well. You've rated yourself. You've categorized yourself. You've given yourself a certain value according to the looks of your earthen vessel. God is inviting us here to look deeper, that there's something we can be thankful for that will not deteriorate, something that we can be grateful for that will not disintegrate, that will not decay. And that is the inner man, the inner self, the new creation, joined to Christ, and he calls it a treasure. And he says the very power of God resides inside of us. What does that tell you about your value, about your worth, about who you are to God? If God decided to take up residence, if you are his zip code, if he has decided to take up residence inside of you, dwelling in you, what does that say about you? That you are valued incredibly, that he cleaned house and moves in and calls you home. That says something about your worth, whether the outer part of you is decaying or not, it will one day be replaced, but that inner part of you, that continues on. You have something unshakable, untakeable, invaluable that God has esteemed and He will spend eternity with you and that begins right now. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The power is of God. It's not of ourselves and yet that power, that person resides literally and actually in you right now. That's pretty incredible. What are we saying? Earth comes at me and Christ works in me. Do you see that beautiful intersection? And yes, there's some pain there. Earth comes at me with grief and loss and death and disease and all kinds of fallenness and darkness. Earth comes at me and Christ works works in me. And right at the intersection of earth and Christ, we experience all kinds of things, some of them beautiful and some of them tragic. Our emotions go up and down and all around. But the hope that Paul is describing in this passage 
He is saying that darkness comes at you and light works in you. Death comes at you and life works in you. Earth comes at you and Christ works in you. If we gain this perspective, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it certainly helps because in the moment we can at least remember that we have purpose and meaning and a future and expectation, something to look forward to. And it's already at work within us, even in the middle of crazy circumstances on the outside. Speaking of crazy circumstances, Paul says, speaking of the apostles primarily, he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I hope you see in these expressions that Paul is describing all of the garbage, the difficulty, the stress, the anxiety, the fear that planet earth brings to him, and yet that's not the end of the story. Afflicted, but not crushed. Perplexed and confused, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken by God. Even struck down physically, but not destroyed. Do you see this perspective? Friend, you have something that can never, ever be taken from you. It can't be belittled. It can't be diminished. It can't be destroyed. You have a powerful treasure in Christ Jesus who lives in you now. And no matter what comes your way, you have a rock-solid, stable reason always to give thanks. You have an anchor. You have something that no one can rip from your grip. You have Jesus, and He'll never abandon you. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Now, much has been made of this verse. In fact, for many years, I believed that this meant that somehow I needed to die. That there was something wrong with me spiritually, and I needed to die. And so as a young man, I began to engage in a morbid theology of sorts. It was a theology that said, I need to kill me. And if I could just kill me and crush myself into a fine powder and allow myself to be broken by God, then eventually I could resurrect and be used by God. And it sounded so humble, it sounded so spiritual, that I would lay my life down on an altar and become some sort of sacrifice in death. I would kill myself spiritually allow myself to be diminished so that it could be all of him and none of me, and therefore I would carry about the dying of Jesus. Now, I don't believe that anymore. If you have followed our church, our ministry here, you must recognize that we teach a beautiful message that affirms the believer. As Colossians says, we are complete It says we're being built up in Him, we're not being torn down. It never says that God wants to break the believer. We talk about brokenness as if God is some sort of morbid surgeon who needs to cause us to death, to die through some sort of assisted death, and then He'll resurrect us later on in the Christian life. And we end up believing, I must decrease and he must increase. We take John the Baptist and his statement about his ministry going away and Jesus's ministry coming in. I must decrease, he must increase. We turn it into this 
morbid theology of dying with Jesus. We got to die to self. We got to die daily. We take Paul out of context when he's talking about physical danger. And guess what's happening in this passage? It's the very same thing. Paul is talking about persecution. Has he not just mentioned in the previous verses that he's been persecuted, that he's been struck down, that he's encountered physical danger, that he's put his life on the line for the sake of the gospel? He's talking about himself and his fellow apostles, and he's talking about the physical danger that he has been in, the situations where he felt persecuted and struck down. And so he's saying that we carry in our bodies as we travel around amidst this incredible persecution, we carry around the message of the cross, the dying of Jesus. And why do we do it? We do it because we know that something within us compels us. Something inside of us inspires us. It is the resurrection life of Jesus. And I want you to know this morning that that is what resides in you. You do not have death residing in you. You have life living in you. The dying is done. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Romans 6, our old self died. Colossians 2, you died with Jesus to the elementary principles of this world. You died already. We say born again. That can't happen unless there's been a death. You died and were born again. That never needs to happen again. And so Paul is simply saying, look at the trouble. Look at the tragedy all around us as we communicate the gospel, as we apostles travel all over the countryside sharing the good news of Jesus. There is trouble and there is tragedy and yet there is triumph coming from within as the life of Jesus Christ is manifest in our body, and we can eagerly expect the fruit of the Spirit to come forth, even in the midst of horrible darkness on the outside, there is light within, and His name is Jesus. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body. You know, at one point, Paul talks about making up for the suffering that was lacking in Christ. What he's saying is, if Christ suffered a thousand ways, Paul suffered 500 more ways. And Christ was at work in Paul, even in Paul's suffering. And here we see a similar statement always being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. He's defending his apostleship. He's not telling you that you need to die daily, die to self, get dead for God. No, he is simply saying that we, the messengers of the gospel, every day we're constantly being delivered over to these incredible circumstances where our very physical life is in danger. We are delivered over to death. Why do we do it? For Jesus' sake. For the sake of the message. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal bodies. We can eagerly expect every day for Jesus to show up in our attitudes and actions. And we love it. We're addicted to Christ. We're slaves of righteousness. We can't Look beyond it. There's nothing greater. God has the market cornered on fulfillment. He lives in us and we have discovered this fulfillment. No matter what attacks us on the outside, we've got Him on the inside and He is amazing. So, death works in us, but life in you. If you've not seen what I've been sharing so far, I hope this verse helps clarify it. This is like a a big red flag waving in the air saying, look, take it in. He says, death works in us, but life works in you. 
Why the dichotomy? Why the discrepancy? Why does he say us and then you? Why does he say death in us and then contrast that with life in you? Because again, he is talking about himself and his fellow messengers, all the apostles that travel and experience this persecution. Death works in us, but why do we do it? We do it so that life works in you, the life of Jesus himself. Does it sound like death is at work in you? No, life is. Does it sound like you need to die to self? No, your old self died. Does it sound like you need to die daily? No, you died to sin once for all. Romans tells us, Jesus died to sin once for all in the same way. Count yourself dead to sin but alive to God. The death that he died, he died to sin once. And he included you in that death. You, my friend, are not dying to sin. You have died. Your old self is not dying, it is dead. You are a new creation and life is at work in you. You're rooted and grounded and being built up, not torn down, not crushed by God, not broken by God. The world is a broken world. The flesh is a broken system. But you are not broken. Yes, we are weak. We are weak. Paul talks about how Christ's power works in the midst of his weakness. When I am weak, then I am strong. The power of Christ rests upon me in the middle of that weakness. We are designed by nature to be dependent. He is God and we are not. And we will never be. We are children of God and therefore we are always dependent on God And we are, by nature, dependent and weak creatures. But that does not mean we are broken. And many people misunderstand those. God is not trying to break us. We simply need to see our weakness and our dependency on the power of Christ. What Christ has done is made us whole and complete. We're lacking nothing. We have everything we need for life and godliness. We are not broken down. We are not crushed by God. We are not torn down. He's not seeking to crush us into a powder and then uh, later make us victorious. This sort of rhetoric has got to stop. Do you recognize that God never tells us in the New Testament that He's trying to humble you? I mean, I find that appalling given the amount of, of... terminology that we have adopted that makes us think that God's trying to teach us a lesson and put us in a corner and make us humble. The scripture says, humble yourself and he will exalt you. What's he doing? He's exalting us. Exalting us? That doesn't seem to fit with the morbid, get yourself out of the way theology we often hear. But Jesus humbled himself. The Father allowed Jesus to humble himself, to make that decision, so to speak, as Jesus was fully man and fully God. But he humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and he was dependent and took on that role of weakness and dependency on the Father to model that for us so that we would humble ourselves And walk in dependency as well. Never broken, always dependent. Never broken, always in weakness and dependency. But never broken by God. We have been made whole. Earth comes at me, Christ works in me. This is what Paul wants us to see. He wants us to adopt this perspective and Here we are, as I said, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, all kinds of tragedy and trouble, disease and death and loss and grief. Earth comes at me. God, where are you? I shake my fist toward the sky. God, why won't you visit us? Why won't you fix this for us? 
Where are you? And here, again, we're reminded in this passage that we have the treasure. We don't have to beg for it. We don't have to pray and hope and wait for it. We have the treasure. We have this powerful treasure called Jesus in us. We're looking up. We need to look in. We're waiting. We need to see we've got him. Earth comes at me. Christ works in me. Death comes at me. Life works in me. Trouble and tragedy come at me. Triumph works in me. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Continuing, he says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. We're in our second part where we're looking at thankfulness, and Paul has said, here's another reason not just to give thanks now, but to give thanks then, to give thanks for something far off in the future. Eternally, not that far off. Nevertheless, there's reason to give thanks right now for the treasure, and there's reason to give thanks for something that's on its way. God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. We're all going to be together again. Have you lost someone that you love? Has someone gone away that you cared so deeply about? Please know this, that you will be present with them again. This is not the end. The page will turn. A new chapter will start. Eternity is real. It begins right now. And the day that you have resurrection eyes, you will lay those eyes right on all those fellow believers who you care so deeply about. You will see them again. For all things are for your sakes, I love this, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. This could be a theme verse for this congregation. This could be a theme for this body, for our church, for our ministry, for our outreach. Look at this and how incredible it is. So that the grace, he names the gospel message grace. Grace is not a trendy movement It's not a special focus. It's not about some sort of modern emphasis on grace. In the book of Acts, the gospel is called the gospel of grace. And here, he refers to this beautiful gospel as grace itself. The grace which is spreading. How is it spreading? Well, they're moving about the planet and they are communicating. What's the message? What are they communicating? The grace of God. The grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Recently, I had a birthday, and for my birthday, many, many times over the years, I've asked for for feedback. I want to hear how people's lives have been impacted by the, the radio broadcast and by our church services and by all that we're doing for outreach. I love to read people's testimonies. I love to see what God is doing in their life and what a privilege we have to play a role in that and be a part of that and partner with people and they with us. And that is what he's talking about here. The grace is spreading to more and more people. And guess what it's causing? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I cannot believe that it's this good. The giving of thanks begins to abound to the glory of God. We are bragging on Jesus. We're bragging on God's grace. We are boasting about the cross. We are bragging about the resurrection. We are totally celebrating the finished work of Jesus Christ, and God loves it. 
Now, is that not a genuine reason to be thankful? No matter what's happening on the outside, we can be partying spiritually on the inside. I mean, celebrating Christ to the max. And when you see how giant the grace of God is, party on, right? Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. There's that conflict, that dichotomy. Earth comes at us and Christ works in us. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Does this sound callous to you? Paul, light affliction? Come on, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Light affliction? It's been worse than that. Remember, this is Paul. He's been persecuted. He's been stoned. Rocks have been thrown in his direction. He's walked away from a a stoning episode. He's been imprisoned. He's been tortured. Eventually, many believe he was killed. I mean, Paul knows about affliction. He's only saying that it is light in comparison to the amazing weight of glory that is at work within us. I wonder if you see your circumstances that way. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they're temporary, they're fleeting. But the things which are not seen are eternal. He's talking about the invisible versus the visible. He's talking about present circumstances versus the beautiful big picture of all that God is doing. He's telling us to put our grace glasses on. He's telling us to put our gospel lenses on and to see everything that comes at us in a new light because of the light which indwells us. Darkness on the outside, light on the inside. Earth comes at me, but I'm convinced that Christ works in me. Are you convinced? Are you ready to say that there's light in the midst of darkness? Are you willing to see that there's life in the midst of death? No matter what your circumstances are, no matter how challenging they are, how stressful they are, how much anxiety and fear they've brought you over the years, Today is your day to see things differently, to recognize there's a powerful treasure within you that no one can take, that Jesus himself is at work, and his promise is, this will all work out for good for those who love me. That's not trite. That's not a pat answer. That is reality for anyone indwelt by the risen Christ. The end of the story we don't yet see, but it is a beautiful story. So next time you're like me, shaking your fist at heaven, asking God why, I hope you've seen today that while we don't have all the answers, there are some beautiful truths that anchor us. Affliction on the outside, delight on the inside. Trouble on the outside, triumph on the inside, death on the outside, life on the inside, earth coming at us, Christ working in us. Turn the page. One day we will all turn the page. One day we will all see the new chapter. So next time you're caught in despair, next time you're feeling fear and anxiety about today and tomorrow, Remember, this is just a blip on the radar. This for you, this very year will become a sentence one day. Remember that year of tragedy. Remember that year of trouble. This will become a sentence for you in the grand story of your life. And you will celebrate Jesus for eternity. Do you see the big picture? Next time you're tempted to despair in the minute, in the moment... Look beyond that minute. 
look to the hour and the day and the week and the month and the year and the decade and then stretch that line out over eternity. Put your Jesus glasses on. See this moment for what it is. Earth comes at you. Christ works in you. We've got to see the invisible. Imagine a church. Imagine the body of Christ that looked beyond the earthen vessel. What if we globally looked beyond our bodies and the tragedy that is so seeable out there? The trouble that is so pervasive, the darkness and the death. What if we put our life glasses on and saw the life of Christ at work within us individually, but also within the bride, within the body, globally and corporately? What if we were encouraged every day by the truth of that very active resurrection life of Jesus That might just turn tragedy into triumph. It might just turn death into life. It might just turn planet earth coming at us to a realization that Christ is truly working in us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We don't have all the answers. We get confused, perplexed. We despair Because we've lost people, we experience disease and death, and this year especially maybe has set a record for us in terms of stress and anxiety and fear and asking questions, wondering where you are. We don't have all the answers. We don't know why everything is allowed to occur, but we do know this, Father, that we believe you. We we believe you and we trust you and we recognize that there is life in us. We recognize that we have something no one can take. We have a powerful treasure. His name is Jesus. We say along with you that He is enough, that in our weakness there is power in Him, that in our trouble there is triumph in Him. We believe you, Father. We trust you with today and tomorrow and the future. We trust you that there's a new chapter. We trust you that there's a beautiful future. We thank you that we get to live it with you even now. In Jesus' name, amen.